Chris, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, Chris. Yeah, we've had we just got done having an hour lunch, uh, and I'm really excited for the conversation. Yeah, me too. Let's just start with kind of a little bit about your background growing up and uh, what led you to what you're doing today at Send Eats. Sure. So I grew up in Central Florida, and um, I I've always just been kind of a hustler, you know, trying to start little businesses here and there, and um, I, I never wanted that to prevent me from going to college. Um, I always wanted to do the college experience. So I, I went to the University of Alabama. I did an undergrad in business and started all kinds of little side hustles there. And, um, and then I started a company that actually took me to Dallas. So it was an e-commerce business and I wanted to be more centrally located. So I moved my family here about seven years ago and um, we've been here ever since. What was the business that you started in college and eventually uh, built and sold? Yeah, so I started a chain of iPhone repair shops. It's called Phone Restore. And it's still, it's still there. It's been sold a couple times since I oh, sold. Oh, really? It. Yeah, and um, all the original locations are still there. And um, I, I sold that to a competitor, and I started a business called LCD Cycle, where we became a wholesale distributor of uh, smartphone parts. And we also figured out a way of how to recycle broken iPhone screens in China so they could be remanufactured and resold. Did that cut you off there? No, no. So we, uh, I moved the business to Dallas so we could ship a lot faster to our customers. So I started with Phone Restore, fixing phones, opened a, a small chain of them, sold it. And then we started selling parts to those same types of stores. Uh, and we, we launched it in Dallas. And where were you getting the parts? From China. Okay, so they, were they used parts or they were brand new parts? They were brand new parts from Shenzhen, China. And was it all for the iPhone or any type of smartphone? Uh, iPhone was like 90% of our sales. Okay. But we did uh, Samsung as well. And did Apple really care that you were buying parts from China and, and using those to kind of rebuild iPhones? No, they they just wanted to be sure that we didn't pretend to be Apple. Yeah. Um, but yeah. Did you ever hear about a business out of um, Silicon Valley called iCracked? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yep. AJ, I think is, he's from Dallas. I don't know if you ever ran into AJ them. Forsyth. Yeah. Yeah. Whatever happened to them? Do you know? I have no idea, but they blew up. Yeah. They were all over the place and I think they're still around, but yeah. I don't know. Interesting. Before we get into business, before you went to college, you spent two years going around the world. Let's talk about that experience. This is the first time I've talked about this on, on the podcast. And I think, it, one, it's an incredible story. But two, I just want to talk about maybe some of the business lessons that you learned doing it. Sure. Yeah. So I'm a member of the Church of Jesus Christ, Latter-day Saints, Okay. also known as Mormons. Mm -hmm. uh, Mitt Romney's Mormon, right? There's a there's a bunch of us out there, about <laughs> 17 million okay. Mormons. And um, uh, when you're 19, uh, now it's 18, actually. Yeah. But when I was... Uh, 19 it was the age was 19 and you basically fill out an application you send it to the headquarters of the church in salt lake and you say i want to serve a mission tell me where i'm going and about three weeks later you get a letter in the mail and you have no idea where you're going to go what language you're going to speak um so you it's a big deal right yeah you get this letter and it said chris kerner you are hereby called to serve as a missionary for the church of jesus christ of latter-day saints in and it could be omaha nebraska it could be Plano, Texas. It could be Australia. In my case, it was Budapest, Hungary. Uh, so Eastern Europe. Um, so I, they shipped us off to the MTC, the okay. Missionary Training Center, okay. which is like a language learning center in, in Provo, Utah. Okay. And I spent 12 weeks there and we learned Hungarian as best as we could. And um, we learned from people who had served that same mission years prior. And then they put us all on an airplane together and they send us to Hungary. And uh, there's about a hundred of us in that particular mission. And we spent two years in Hungary and uh, they just kind of sent us out like, hey, go preach the good word. Yeah. Spread the gospel. So do you grow up your whole life knowing that that is like, is it something that's mandatory that you must do that you kind of prepare for your whole life or you kind of opt in or opt out once you get of age? So young men are encouraged to go. Uh -huh. They don't have to go. Um, young women are encouraged to go. It's more expected for the men to go than okay. for the women. Um, but no one, like you're not shunned if you don't go. Right. But most young men in good standing, yeah. um, they go. Yeah. And that's what you do. And some don't know they're going to go until, you know, they just feel called to go at the last minute. And some grow up their whole lives knowing they're going to go. And um, what were you, which camp did you fall in? I, I always knew I was going to go. You're going to go. Even when I was just a piece of crap teenager, yeah. just making stupid decisions. Uh, I just knew I was always going to go. Yeah. And I wanted to go foreign and. That's what and so when you submit, 
you um do you get to write down like your top three locations that you would like to go? It's purely just a blind kind of lottery type thing. Yeah. I mean, we believe that the the pro, the leaders of the church, so they look over every application. Okay. And we believe that they are inspired to send us where we need to be going and where we should be going. And so it's actually kind of a crazy story. Um, I have, we call her an adopted grandma. Yeah. And it's my grandma's good friend and she's Hungarian. Okay. And she's a faithful woman. And she prayed, and I didn't know this at the time, but she prayed and prayed that I would go to Hungary to teach her ancestors and her family. And she didn't even tell me this. And so when I got my calling to Hungary, I was, I thought of her and I was like, oh, hi, Julia's from Hungary. And then I called her and she just like started crying. She's like, I've been praying for you to go to Hungary. <laughs> so I was like, wow, like this is where I need to go. Yeah. And there was, there's like 400 different missions out there. Okay. So it is, you know, a quarter of a percent of a chance yep. of going to that particular mission. And I did. And so to to put it in perspective for anybody listening, though, you, you kind of, am I guessing you were wearing like a short sleeve button down every day, the tie. That's it. You got, do you get a bike when you get there? Uh, some missions, yes. Yeah, some no. We walked everywhere. Okay. In my mission. So what is the goal of the mission? So we want to teach people about our church. And we also want to do service activities, yep. um, physical labor, whatever it is. Um, we just want to g- be a force for good. It doesn't have to be a religious force for good, yeah. but just we just want to put ourselves out there and go um, teach people and serve people. So you go to training for 12 weeks, you learn Hungarian. Are they teaching you anything else about what to do on the mission? Like what you're going to be kind of asking for teaching? Mm-hmm. Is it, yeah. Yeah. They teach us about like more about the religion. So we actually know what we're teaching. Yeah. Because a lot of us don't, you know, and um, but most of it is language centric and they they try to get us into the schedule. You wake up at 630, you work out for a half hour, you spend an hour studying by yourself, then you spend an hour studying with your companion, and then you spend an hour studying the language. And then uh, you just get out there and you just knock doors and you go out to a public square and you start talking to people and you just get rejected hundreds of times a week. Did you know who you were going to be going with or you're kind of paired up with some random we're paired up with strangers. Yeah. Um, so every six weeks they have transfers where you might switch either areas or companions. Yeah. And so sometimes you're in the same area or with the same companion for months at a time. Sometimes you switch every six weeks. Okay. So this is where now it starts kind of bleeding into like business practices. So you're out, you are, you're a force for good. But when we talked on the phone, you're like, what I was like, how would you be graded on your performance? Like what? And you said, mm-hmm. I think it was setting meetings. Like, how'd you know if you were doing a good job and spreading good? Yeah. So it's, it's all business oriented. Um, so seven, seven habits of highly effective people. You yeah. So Stephen Covey is a member of the church. Okay. And a lot of the principles we follow on the mission were framed after that book. Okay. And so at the end of every week, we have a planner and we, every day we write down how many phone numbers did we get? How many people did we talk to? How many appointments did we set? How many appointments did we have? How many people did we invite to church? How many people did we baptize? How many people did we invite to be baptized? And those are KPIs basically. Yeah. And then at the end of the week, we report those to our superior who is like either a district leader or a zone leader or an assistant to the president. And then that's kind of a a metric that I guess the mission president um, looks at to, to determine how effective we are as missionaries. And so like the Nirvana would be getting somebody to basically convert mm-hmm. and go get baptized like that. If you, if there was one thing that you could accomplish, that would have been like the thing. That's it. Yeah. How, how, over two years, did you accomplish it? I did. Yeah. How'd that make you feel? Um, it was good. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I helped like eight to 10 people yeah. get baptized and in some missions, that's a ton. Some missions, you go the whole two years, whole two years, and you never baptize anyone. And then if you go to you know poorer areas, Central or South America, you could baptize hundreds in two years. Um, so like, it's kind of like Guatemala on one end and Switzerland on the other end. And you're getting um, the the whole time. So so you said you did eight to ten, and this is kind of a weird question, but like, how long's the sales cycle? Are some like you meet them and the next day they're like, I'm ready, or is this like a year long process of lots of little meetings? Yeah, that's a great question. So sometimes it's uh, it's as little as three weeks. Yeah, we like to see them hit certain things, like they need to stop smoking. Yeah, they can't be um, living with a partner and not married. Um, they have to, 
you know, ob- abide certain principles. They have to go to church two times. So we try to not baptize them too fast because the chance of them be- becoming inactive is much greater. We want them to be ingrained in the community. Got it. And sometimes it takes generations. Yeah. I mean, decades, you know, there, there have been men that have met with missionaries for decades and just no, 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 no. And then they meet one guy from, you know, Burley, Idaho, this farmer that just connected with him somehow. And he's like, this is my guy. I'm going to get baptized. I'm in. Yeah. So it just depends on the person. And in the first meeting, you're talking about who you are, why you're there. Is is like, can you tell almost like um, in the moment, like this is going to be somebody that that's interested or is it usually the same and you're just continuing to kind of chip away at it? A lot of times you can tell. Yeah. You call them golden investigators. Yeah. And they're just like, yeah, this, this feels good. This is yeah. ringing true to me. That's awesome. Yeah. And sometimes you can't tell. Were you good at handling rejection before all this? Um, before the mission? Yeah. I don't, I didn't have a lot of opportunities to be rejected. Yeah. yeah. So I don't know. Yeah. But I know I'm pretty good at it now. Yeah. I got a lot of practice at least. Yeah. I mean, entrepreneurs bust through walls. It sounds like that's like the ultimate way to just keep busting through walls. Yeah. It's a great lesson. All right. So then uh, now we'll bounce back. So um, you build that business, you sell it, and then let's talk about Send Eats. Let's start with what it is, and then let's talk about the story of kind of how you spun it up, um, yeah. the, the pure entrepreneur way. Yeah. So Send Eats is a COVID baby, is what we call them, plain yeah. and simple. We it. would not be in business without COVID. Um, it started because I had a good friend who had a... Um, like a homestyle bread company. And they've been in business for 30 years. They sell just regionally here in DFW to grocery stores. And people would move into DFW. They'd fall in love with his bread. They'd move away and they can't get it anymore. They would email him and say, hey, could you ship your bread? And he's like, nah, I don't want to mess with it. It's too bulky. It's too expensive. And we would have lunch every couple months and talk about this. And coming from e-commerce, I would be like, Keith, like you need to ship your bread. Like it's not that hard. Yeah. No, I don't want to. I don't want to. So one day we just said, I had some time and I was curious. And I thought, Keith, I wonder if you could, because he would sell like 10,000 loaves a week. So there's 10,000 different people a week that have his product in their hands already. So I thought, I wonder if we could put an advertisement inside the loaf of bread that said, hey, we ship online now. So if you have friends out of state or whatever, they can buy from us online. And he's like, oh yeah, I should try that. And it was clear he wasn't going to do it. So I was like, all right, Keith, I'm going to do this for you. Like, that's just as a favor. And if it doesn't work out, no harm, no foul. If it does, then you can give me a percentage of sales that come through your website. He's like, okay, sure. No problem. So I set up a website and I had some inserts designed and I had, I trained his employees in the factory, how to put them in each loaf of bread. And then it started driving traffic to the site and he was selling bread and it became like a, I don't know, five to 10% sales boost, but it was almost pure profit. Yeah, because he would make a loaf for a dollar, sell it to a grocery store for two fifty, and they would sell it for five. But now he would sell it directly to the customer for five or six, yep. and then they would pay for shipping. And so he, his eyes were kind of open. He's like, "Man, this is this is working," and it was going okay. And then COVID hit, so this was just like three months before COVID. Yeah, and his customer base is primarily baby boomers that were not going to the grocery store. And so his sales literally 10 X literally, and it just went crazy. And so me being just an opportunist, um, I can't like see an opportunity and not do something like it. You probably understand it's physically impossible for me to not take action. (laughs) So like, I always joke, I got all of my hobbies. I try to monetize because I just, I can't, you know, I can't not. (laughs) And so I was like, this could be a business like e-commerce as a service. That's what I was calling it at the time. Anyway, I didn't know what, you know, e-commerce fulfillment was or 3PLs were. And I thought, man, there are so many baby boomers out there with food brands that only sell regionally that just have this amazing niche product that people would buy nationwide. And they're not about to go online. So I could bring them online take a percentage of their sales and fulfill orders for them. And so I started looking at domain names and um, sendeats.com was available. And, you know, I'm kind of a domain name junkie. And I just, I was shocked that a two syllable, two word domain name was available. So I was like, now I have to do it. I have to do this. So I bought the domain name and then I posted about it in a Facebook group I'm in, in the trends group. And I just said, hey guys, um, they just posted an article about 
stuff as a service, right? Other yeah. than software as a service. So I, I said, what about e-commerce as a service? I'm going to help my friend Brett or Keith ship this bread. Um, what do you guys think? And I got a ton of comments. You could still go look it up in the group. Ton of people. Wow, that's interesting. And then I got like two customers from that post. There was a, uh, a butter company out of New Zealand. So my first two customers were bread and butter. So bread and butter was our bread and butter. And, <laughs> and we started shipping their products and we got like, I leased a corner of my friend's warehouse and then we outgrew it. And I leased a corner of my other friend's bigger warehouse. And then we got our own warehouse in uh, Allen that was like 1600 square feet, just like just enough to pull the truck into. And um, we got a big industrial freezer to store the butter. And then we got an ice cream customer. And then we got a 10,000 square foot warehouse in Plano. And then we're growing into 30,000 square feet in a couple months. So we yeah. just we fulfill orders for not just food companies now, but any type of e-commerce brands. So when you were starting with the bread group and you said, okay, I'm gonna put the flyer in, was was the website going to your website or their website? Like his where website. were the order? Okay, so you were you had just plugged in something to his website to where he could start taking online orders. Mm-hmm. He already had a website, so I just enabled it for e-commerce. And then you would just get like a notification that said, Hey, a hundred loaves have been purchased yesterday. And mm-hmm. then your your um promise to him was I'll figure out how to get them fulfilled and, and over. Exactly. Okay. And then as it stands today, uh, we can just stay on that bread company or we can talk about any company, but you now, he gets orders. Uh, let's say a thousand loaves of bread were ordered yesterday. He has those thousand loaves delivered to your warehouse that you've leased. And your job mm-hmm. is to get those packaged up and out the door to UPS or whoever is going to deliver them. Yep. And exactly. you're doing that for all small businesses. Yep. Um, and now you're not just doing it for food. You're doing it for products too. Yep. Exactly. Is it easier to do products than food or does it really not matter? Yeah. Or? Food is something that our competitors don't really want to touch. Uh-huh. Um, so perishable rodents can be an issue. Um, so we've kind of figured that out. We kind of started with the hardest type of product to fulfill and now we do anything. And so yeah, food is harder, but. So you started, you had, you had e-commerce experience in your previous business, but obviously you kind of said, I didn't know what a 3PL was. I wasn't, now you've been in it a year, your COVID baby's a year old, Mm -hmm. like looking back on it, what have been like the biggest, uh, obvious things that you're working on now that just were not obvious at the time? Hmm. Well, um, better technology, better software. Um, I had basically with my previous e-commerce business, I didn't know what a 3PL was because we always fulfilled ourselves. Okay. Um, it was a low margin business, wholesale e-commerce. And yeah. so 3PLs were not an option to us. And so that kind of made us learn how to do this really affordably and efficiently. Yeah. Um, but looking back, uh, I would have invested much sooner on more inventory controls, inventory tracking, more technology, because when we started out, it was like, oh, just send us your products. We can ship it out. No problem. And yeah. then suddenly you've got 20 different customers, some have 10 products, some have 2000 and they're all in the same warehouse and they're constantly swapping out products, adding products, removing products, being shipped out. And so inventory control and management is just a nightmare. It's really difficult. And are you designing, are you now designing that process or the software that you're currently using has designed that for you? The software is on it for us. Yeah. So let's just say I'm a t-shirt guy i make t-shirts and i make all different types of t-shirts so what i'll do is i'll send you a palette of all my different t-shirts different or different kind of designs and sizes they get in you have a palette of all my stuff and then every single day my po systems i guess plugged into your software and you're like oh chris sold 15 large yellow shirts six red ones and two medium blue ones your group packages them all up and UPS comes by at whatever time you mm-hmm. load them on the truck and it's done. Yeah, exactly. But now we need to know how many of those shirts do we have left? Do we have six blue that are double X, three light blue that are triple X? Like maintaining control over the inventory is is a struggle. Are, have you noticed, is there a lot of small businesses that don't ship online because of the daunting idea of all this logistics and fulfillment? Yes. So there's like a huge opportunity to go to all these small businesses around the country and go, it's actually not that hard to, to ship. We'll take that problem for you. Yeah. You just set this online order thing on your on your website and let us handle the rest. Exactly. 
Or we say, this is really hard. You don't want to do it. Yeah. <laughs> we will do it for you. Yeah. But you'll make a lot of money if you do it successfully. The, yeah. or the, the customer will. Is the right. Pitch. You get more margin. Yeah. And we we get approached by a lot of customers that are doing 100 to 300 orders a month that want to use us. And we just say, listen, like you're probably not big enough to outsource this yet. Like you really need to do this yourself, learn everything, grow a little bit, and then let's talk because it, it doesn't make financial sense for a lot of really smaller brands to outsource it. When is somebody big enough to for it to make sense? Is it industry by industry or is it usually a yeah. certain amount of sales? It depends on the industry. Is it a product that they have to manufacture more frequently or is it a product they can order a container from from china and it'll last for six months how much space does it take up how big are the products how fast is the sell through um, but it just depends but usually around 500 to a thousand orders a month is a good time to start looking at outsourcing it and when we were when we were having lunch a little bit ago you were like i'm in that phase of growing the business where i'm working 80 hours a week mm -hmm. just Let's just riff for a little bit on what is what's going on for 80 hours a week at this startup that's growing like mega fast. You have done spent no money on marketing. These are all referrals. Your business is growing like a weed. So like what does a week look like for you right now? So uh, get up early. I take my son to to was he in fifth grade. Yeah. I get to the warehouse about 745. I have a meeting with my my leaders, my team, um, and then about 20 employees show up. And we've got thousands of orders to ship out and we have service level agreements that we have to meet. Um, a lot of those have to be, we fulfill same day up until 3 PM or noon sometimes. Um, but maybe the, you know, we've got a thousand orders to fulfill with this type of peanut butter in it, but that truck with that peanut butter isn't showing up until noon. And so we have to get them out the door fast. And so we have to get the inventory set up. We have to clear rate racks in the pallet to make sure we have a place for it to go. We have to have the labor lined up and then, um, we we have to scan everything one by one when it comes in. And so then we're packing orders up until 6 p.m., which is, you know, 11 hours later, 10 hours later. And then um, we have a lot of times we have a second shift come in, an evening shift comes in um, to help. Like if it's on a Monday, we have to fill orders that came in from Friday afternoon all the way up until Monday morning. So it's three days worth of fulfillment. Oh, wow. So we'll fill late into the night. And then we have to get inventory counts right back to the, the inventory management, but we can't do that until we've already shipped out all those products. So then we're there late counting inventory so we can get the data to our customer. So they know, all right, do I need to send them more? Do I need to manufacture more? Are they good? And so it's just, it's a lot of, I mean, we went from shipping a hundred orders a day to a thousand orders a day in just a few months. So a lot of hiring, a lot of interviews, um, turnover can be a little high in the yeah. industry. Um, a lot of people issues uh, at times. Who set up your floor? Like, are you just learning as you go? What's most efficient? <laughs> We're learning as we go. Yeah. Um, we actually got a grant from UPS where they're paying for a consultant to come in. And he spent actually all of last week, he was on site with us saying, all right, like, what if this person moved this box over here? That way they only have to turn their body, you know, this many degrees instead of that many degrees. And over the course of weeks, it will save you this much. And so it's super helpful stuff, um, stuff that we wouldn't even know to do ourselves. And so. So take me through just this, like, where does the, where does the risk lie in your business? So when is the risk over for the small business is making the product. When does the risk kind of start for you and when does it end for you? The moment their product lands on our, our loading dock. But it's their job to get it to you. Correct. You have nothing to do with that arriving on time. Correct. Okay. Yeah. And so we take possession of it. Now we are responsible for making sure how much inventory came in and uh, communicating that count to them and then making sure that a month from now, six months from now, that inventory matches up with how much they sold and how much they shipped us originally. And so then we are accountable for that inventory up until the moment that FedEx, UPS, or USPS takes it over and delivers it to its final destination. So if you guys had some extra inventory, let's just say you were doing maybe some pottery and like something fell over and broke, mm -hmm. that's on you? It's on us, yeah. And do you just have some type of insurance policy that insures it? Yeah, we do. Do you have to get an insurance policy for each customer and their product, or is it kind of just one blanket deal? We, we have a blanket policy, yeah. but we also ask our customers to insure their own products. Um, it just makes it a lot more efficient for us to not have to insure other people's products. So we have a blanket coverage policy that... that um, 
our landlord wants to see, of course, in a liability policy. Um, and then we have a blanket policy for our products, but we ask our customers to have one as well. Do you do anything with Amazon? We do. We do what's called FBA prep, okay. fulfillment by Amazon prep. Um, actually, about a year ago, Amazon told all their sellers like, hey, if you're not selling as much as we'd like to see, you can only keep 200 orders worth of products here, which was like a huge shock because I mean, people all over the world sell on Amazon in America. So suddenly they had to find an intermediary like us where they could ship their pallets of goods to, and then we would have to prep it and label it according to Amazon standards, and then only ship it to them once they were exhausting their supply that Amazon kept in stock. So we actually work hand in hand with Amazon a lot just to get their their customers' products to them when their inventory on site has been exhausted. So are they like an ally to y'all or are they a competitor also? Do they act in both capacities? Both. Yeah. So how do you think of them as a competitor then? I mean, so we love Shopify. Yeah. Right. And so Toby, the CEO of, of Shopify, he says that Amazon is like the uh I'm sorry, I'm I'm not a big Star Wars fan, but the, I'm not either. Okay. Well who's what's like Darth Vader's like their you a Star Wars guy? Yeah. What do you mean? Oh, look, he's all happy. So <laughs> Shopify says that they're arming the rebels, whereas Amazon is the empire. The empire. Yeah. So Amazon's the empire. Okay. Shopify arms the rebels because if you have a store on Amazon, you don't have any data. You have nothing. You don't, They even took away addresses. What? Yeah. So you don't know your customer's address, their email address, phone number, anything. Whereas Shopify, it's your site. You have their name, their address. You can email them. You could text them. And so Shopify is all about power to the people. People can have their own data, their own store. Shopify will take 1% of your sales. And um, Amazon is the opposite. They want all the data, all the sales. and But they're also going to provide you an amazing service. They're going to they're physically going to deliver the product for you. They're not even going to hand it over to UPS. So it's, it's, we work with them and they're a huge competitor as well. So, you, you know, I, I just read on Twitter, you often are reading more about how small businesses wish they didn't have to work with Amazon mm -hmm. and they love Shopify. Mm -hmm. Is that how you feel it from your side of the table too? Absolutely. Yeah. But Amazon's moat is just caught, like they can deliver at a better cost. They can mm -hmm. provide you way more customers. Yeah. Like, so when a small business is deciding to go Shopify or Amazon, can you maybe speak to why they pick one over the other? Sure. So I would suggest they use both, right? Okay. Use an omni-channel strategy, sell on Walmart, on Shopify, on eBay, on Amazon, everywhere you can, right? But um, you're not going to get the data from Amazon. They the Their fees are pretty high, but their delivery fees are pretty aggressive. And so we suggest that they lean into Shopify the most heavily because they can own the marketing, they can own the data, um, but to also utilize Amazon as a second channel. Because what we all know what Amazon will do is they'll they'll rip off your product, right? And a Amazon Basics means Amazon basically stole an entrepreneur's idea, okay. right? And it sounds evil and terrible, but that's what grocery stores do as well, yep. right? They see what's selling well in their stores and they'll make it a great value brand, you know? So Amazon's doing the same thing. Allbirds, they got ripped off by Amazon. I know. And so they refuse to sell on Amazon. Um, and so it, you're foolish to just avoid Amazon, but you're, I, I think you're foolish to also depend on them wholly because for instance, Amazon affiliates, there were thousands of Amazon affiliates out there a year or two ago that were making 14% of every sale that they pushed through to Amazon. And then overnight, Amazon said, it's actually 2% now, deal with it. Like you're gonna make 2% margin. Yeah, instead of 14, overnight. and put all these guys out of business and they can because they're Amazon, right? They're in the driver's seat. And so I I don't know how I could stay up at night knowing that all of my living was dependent on Amazon. Their customer service is terrible. Like the seller experience, like you could sell $10 million a month on Amazon and you're going to have to call a 1-800 number and be on hold for hours to speak to someone who's not going to care about you, who might've lost your inventory and can't help you with it. Like they just, they don't care. And is that because they're so uh, customer obsessed, it's almost like they're purposefully don't give a shit so that, that they fatigue sellers and eventually just take over their business? Exactly. I mean, they're a lot like PayPal and eBay. Like it's a, it's a marketplace, right? And so I don't know how a company could obsess over both sides of the marketplace. Right. There are a lot more consumers out there than there are sellers and small businesses. And so they always fault the small business in favor of the consumer. Um so someone has to take the fall for that. 
So, I mean, you never, it's like hard to even comprehend Amazon losing any steam. But like, as I hear these stories more and more, it seems so obvious that like the Amazon way is not the way if you're a seller of product, but you're kind of forced into it. So it's like what you said is like, look, leave it as a channel, but definitely stack the deck with other channels as well. Totally. Yeah. Um, God, that's interesting. Okay. Uh, so COVID hits, obviously kind of, I hate to say it, but a perfect time for your business. Like, how would you describe kind of the growth right now going on in how small businesses are starting to ship? And we, we'll get into competitors and technology, but kind of what's the landscape look like? I know you're only in it a few months before COVID, but what has COVID done for this business model? Yeah. So COVID pushed e-commerce adoption forward about seven or eight years. Okay. Um, if you were to look at a, a chart of e-commerce adoption, it literally did this in the month of March, 2020. Yep. And so right now our tailwinds are threefold. So one, um, our customer sales are growing, right? So we're, the more orders they ship, the more we ship, the more money we would make because we make money per order shipped Two, the entire e-commerce market is growing. Um, and then three is the fact that, um, I forgot the third one. Yeah, I just forgot. That's okay. But you can think about it. Okay. Um, okay. So you have, but, but you do have a macro tailwind. So as you're, cause we talked about this earlier, you said one of our customers does, you know, 50% of our business right at currently. And I said, um, is that cause they're growing? You're like, no, we've actually picked up a lot more, but, um, are they growing because now they're a, because more people are buying or because now all these legacy businesses are going, oh shit, we can ship online and we're just selling all these new products that we were never selling before? Or is it kind of both? It's kind of both. Yeah. Okay. And the third phase of that I, I remembered is the fact that we're growing as a business, right? So yeah. we're acquiring more customers. The macro tailwinds are, are at our back and our customers themselves are growing. And so we are seeing our customers growing, but every time we take on a new customer, it can add it can jump the size of our business by 10 to 15 percent yep. to each new customer. So. How are you finding customers right now? Hey, we're just inbound. Um, we've actually started producing a lot of content two months ago. We put out about a blog article a day, and we've been really consistent about that. Um, so we just get inbound leads, and then we just get referrals from our partners. Is there a customer that you won't take? Uh, yes. Yeah, there's actually quite a few. What do those look like? Um, just low-volume customers, Okay. first of all. Um, customers that have too many SKUs, too many products. And really, it's more of like an order shipped to SKUs ratio. Um, so if someone has 5,000 SKUs, but they're doing 50,000 orders a month, we can work with that. Okay. If they have 5,000 SKUs and they're doing 500 orders a month, it's just not worth it. Yep. Um, customers that their products are too bulky, uh, furniture, it's just not worth the warehouse space. Your warehouse space is at a premium, as you know. Um, our pallet racks only go so high. Our, our warehouse isn't as tall as a lot of the other warehouses in the area. Yeah. Um, we have a climate controlled warehouse and because we do have food grade customers, which enables us to accept some uh, cosmetics customers as well that also need that climate control range. So yeah, so I say bulky products. Um, a lot of glass products are hard because they are more breakable, uh, not just in the warehouse uh, on a pallet basis, but as they ship. So it's more exceptions that we have to take care of when uh, jars arrive sh uh, broken. So there's all types of customers that we we won't accept. And as we grow, we are we're able to get a little more picky. Yeah. Whereas a year ago, it was like, oh yeah, yeah, sure, we can do that, no problem. Right. So <laughs> yeah, it's say yes and figure it out later. Exactly. How, um, how do you build, like, how do you, how do you build a customer? Like, how do y'all think about it? Um, we build them on a monthly basis. Okay. Based on how many orders they ship. Okay. And how much they store with us. So we try to be different and not charge for storage fees or receiving fees. Yeah. Um, but we charge, uh, the, our bread and butter is a, a pick and pack fee. So every single order that they ship that we ship for them, we charge a few dollars for depending on the customer. And that price can go down on volume or on simplicity. They only have one SKU yep. and it's small and it goes in a padded envelope. We don't have to charge very much at all for that. But if they have thousands of SKUs or hundreds of SKUs, or it's just difficult, it's a difficult product, then we, we have to charge more for that. What's the most difficult product you ship right now? Um, that would probably be ice cream bars. Okay. Yeah. People order that online. They do. <laughs> yep. Okay. 
<laughs> so you just so I'm assuming that comes in. It's in your freezer, climate controlled. You're taking it out, probably dropping it in with some uh, dried ice mm-hmm. in a styrofoam box, maybe putting in a cardboard box, and it's out the door. Yep. Or does it just stay in the styrofoam? It stays in. It goes in a styrofoam box that's inside a cardboard box. And so we have to cut the dry ice to size. We have to wrap the dry ice. We have to label it so people don't touch it because it can burn them. And then we have to kind of figure out how much dry ice we need based on how much product is in there. What time of year is it? What is the temperature here and in where it's going? How far away is it going? Do we need air? Do we need ground? Um, what does the customer prefer? Sometimes they have preferences like don't ship FedEx because my the driver will never make it here. And so it's just like, it's, it's, it's very difficult. All right. Let's go down this rabbit hole for a little bit. Sure. Who is so is the customer coming to you first saying, hey, we're going to sh- like we we do ice cream bars. This is how you need to package them all and get them ready. Or is that on you to learn how they need to be packaged? It totally depends on the customer. OK, um, we have some customers that have never done it themselves. They used another 3PL and they're switching to us. OK, uh, we prefer that the customer tells us exactly what works. Yeah. Um, if they don't, then we figure it out. We do tests. We have these remote sensors that we'll put in a box with dry ice. We'll put it in a hot garage. We'll monitor the temperature. It can take weeks for us to do these tests before we really know what is a safe way to ship this. If we're shipping chocolate, um, does it have a higher um, quantity of wax in the chocolate? If so, it's not as meltable. We can. Sh- it's a little more hardy. Yeah. Um, are we shipping up north in the spring? or down south in the summer, there's so many variables where we literally have to test for all these different types of scenarios. So is there technology right now that's like, I'm I'm just imagining in any one day, you're like, oh, we're shipping this bar, you know, 100 miles away in Texas, or no, we're shipping this one up to northern Maine. You just kind of type in the address and it spits out the like temperature calculations and distance and says like, here's how you should pack it. I don't know of a software that does that, no. We do it manually. Anybody listening to this, you might have just come you up go. with your billion dollar idea. There it is. So, but okay, so now I'm going back to this. Uh, I'm envisioning your 20 workers showing up for work in the morning and you're going, hey, we're going to ship a thousand of these like, uh, you know, ice cream sandwiches today. And they're looking at each order going, all right, this one's going to Maine. It's like, is there something that's telling them like how long the truck route's going to be? Like, how are they getting the information in front of them to make the decision on how to pack that ice cream bar? So thankfully, our ice cream customer is a very small customer and we don't have to do anywhere near that level of volume for them. Yeah. Um, And generally, when we hand the label over to the warehouse fulfillment associate, that work's already been done for them. They just need to look at the packing slip and know, all right, this is how much dry ice you need to put in there. And this is the size box that I need to use. What about a customer that, let's just say it's not a perishable food, but maybe it's like some fashion brand that likes really nice packaging and Mm -hmm. they want it to be real elegant, the the experience. Like I imagine an Apple. I mean, half the fun of buying an iPhone is just taking it out of this white box. It's so crystal clean and amazing um do they give you the instructions this is exactly how we want it packed yes and then you just kind of train each person this is how we pack this stuff yeah we'll take a video a training video and then we'll have to get all of our workers certified on that particular customer and who certifies them you or some like third-party agency no like our warehouse manager will okay yeah So there's a lot of work that goes into each customer that we onboard. So we really have to make sure that this is a customer that we want, right? Do they do enough volume for us to be actually be able to make money on them? And so the way that you um, kind of provide more value is obviously the larger you get, you can probably rent space for cheaper. You can negotiate more with uh, UPS and Mm -hmm. FedEx. With the carriers. Um, And then do you pass that off to the customer? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So we will, in most cases, upcharge shipping. Yep. Um, and a lot of times that's because we get a lot of back charges yeah. weeks or months later. Like the optical scanner that, that FedEx runs the package through says that we got an overage or the address wasn't validated. And so we have to come back and pay for those. So we compensate for that by reselling our rates at a small upcharge. Got it. So is Amazon going to put FedEx and UPS out of business? Like how are they starting to 
posture and position themselves to not get wiped out by Amazon? That's a good question. I don't know. I I see them all working in concert with one another, especially as the market grows so much, because really none of the carriers can handle the volume they have right now. It, will Amazon become like a UPS where you might just hire them purely to ship stuff? Or do you have to be buying through Amazon to use their fleet? Right now, you have to be buying through Amazon. Yeah. Um, I wonder if they are going to get into that business kind of like they did with AWS. Um, what Amazon's done is actually really interesting. They've taken their biggest cost centers and turned them all into profit centers. Yeah. Uh, from warehousing to data storage to delivery. What do you look for in a building? Like what matters to you? Um, climate controlled. Okay. And um, loading docks. And we want to have office space there as well. So about 10 to 20% office space and then the rest warehouse space. And we also want it to be centrally located. So we're in Plano right now. We're able to mm, a lot more easily hire than a lot of our competitors are that are in more rural areas. Mm -hmm. um, so that's, that's huge for us. And can you describe, um, the question is how well positioned is DFW from like in the logistics world? Like, are we considered a 10 out of 10? Like we just got it all. It's perfect. It's perfect. Why? Um, so that's why I moved here. Actually, when I had my last company, the e-commerce business, we were in Huntsville, Alabama. Okay. And I looked at our customer database one day and I was like, man, we've got this guy in Nashville. This guy's in Atlanta. Like this guy's in Birmingham. And I talked to him and I said, why did you choose us? And I'm like, oh, cause I can, I can pay for ground shipping and which is free. We had it for orders over $200 ground was free, but I can get it overnight. So it's like I'm paying for overnight so I can manage my cash flow much better because I can place orders every single day. Yeah. I don't have to store inventory on site. So that was like this huge light bulb moment for me where I thought, what am I doing in Huntsville, Alabama? Like I started this business here because I lived here, but this is a logistics business. It's not strategic for me to live in Huntsville, Alabama. And so I looked at a map and I, I just typed in random zip codes into FedEx's website and looked at the one day ground radius. And it was either like LA, I'm not moving there. Yeah. Uh, Chicago or New York or Dallas. And Dallas is one day shipping to Austin, the 10th biggest metroplex. Houston is the third biggest metroplex. San Antonio is like the eighth biggest. And, uh, and then Dallas, Fort Worth, and then Oklahoma City, Little Rock, Shreveport, all within one day. Tens of millions of people. And so I thought, I, we need to move to Dallas. Like I need to open up a second distribution center, leave the one in Huntsville so I can keep serving them. So we moved here seven years ago for that reason. And since then, um, it's an e-commerce hub. It's a logistics hub here in Dallas for that exact same reason. It's, it's almost perfect. Um, if you're looking at a pure population play, yeah. um, the Lehigh Valley of Pennsylvania is a little bit better. But not it's not as centrally located, but it serves a bigger population because you you can ship two day ground from Key West to Maine to Chicago from um, Eastern Pennsylvania. So if we were to open a second warehouse, it would be there. And that would and, and remind me again, what would if you went to Lehigh Valley, Pennsylvania, that would give you access to which markets? Basically, the whole north, the whole northeast, all the way down to Florida into Chicago. So it's like seventy percent of the country's population so what you were talking about is same day shipping so if you're looking at a logistics um we'll call it a city or a hub the things that matter to you are which markets can i get to in one day or less uh -huh. or two days or less yeah so i guess i was comparing one day in dallas versus two day in lehigh valley got it um, but still if you look at one day from eastern pennsylvania it can get new jersey new york and all those tens of millions of people there but really reno nevada gets the whole west coast Dallas gets the whole, you know, central area and then Pennsylvania gets the whole East Coast. And is it purely based on like physical distance? Like Reno, if I'm thinking of the West Coast, is in that perfect location that it's physical distance away from San Francisco, L.A. Mm -hmm. is right. Or does it have something to do with the type of highways or train systems or airports? Or is it purely just based on physical distance? It's both. OK, it is both. Yeah. And so when you're sh when when products coming into you, is it usually coming in on rail? Is it coming in on truck? How do you get it received? All three ways. So we will receive palletized shipments via air. OK. Um, and but usually via truck, sometimes intermodal, sometimes goes from rail to truck. Yeah. But yeah, being in DFW offers us the flexibility of doing that. And when it's going out, all you worry about is some type of trucks coming to pick it up at your facility. But what it gets put onto from there is mm -hmm. that's now on the uh, on, on our PS or whatever. Yeah. Um, 
what's the hardest part about the business right now? It's, uh, and I'm not trying to, um, everything always sounds easier than it is. Packages come in, packages right. go out, and we just got to make sure we do it all. But uh, give us a little more peek behind the hood. What is like super difficult and what do you look to kind of change to make it not as difficult and valuable to the customer? Yeah. So one thing that's difficult is forecasting our demand. Uh, the sales cycle is really long. So on one hand, we can know with pretty good certainty how many customers we'll have this summer or okay. this fall. But what we don't know is exactly when they'll be onboarding because they're at the mercy of their manufacturer or their co-packer. Okay. And so I need to hire accordingly. I need to make sure we have enough manpower to ship orders for new customers that are in the pipeline right now, but I don't exactly know when they're coming on. So basically keeping enough labor, growing with the labor has been a challenge while also trying to be a company that specializes in shipping fast yeah. because a lot of our customers, um, they won't ship for two days. So if you go online and place an order for all birds, um, they won't even, sh if you order on a Monday, they won't even ship it till a uh, Wednesday because they're so backed up and they don't really prioritize that part of the business. Whereas we'll ship it on Monday. And that's what makes us different because, you know, Amazon has trained us all to expect that product very, very fast. Yep. And so if we want to be a Shopify store, or if we want to serve Shopify stores that offer a similar experience to Amazon, we need to be able to have that competitive advantage and just be there late shipping and just to go the extra mile. So Forecasting labor demand has is, is been a big issue. What about technology? Is there technology opportunities within the space? Yeah, there is. So we we utilize a third party, a 3PL software. Okay. And I don't want to <clears throat> name them by name because I don't love them, but there's only three options out there. There's only three e-commerce fulfillment soft, software options out there. And all of them are terrible, in my opinion. Um, they're just clunky. They're outdated. They're hard to use. They take months of onboarding calls. They're thousands of dollars a month and they don't get the whole job done. They're just good enough. And so that's a big struggle for us right now is, you know, do we spend hundreds of thousands of dollars and hire a software team to build out our own software? And then a year later, maybe we have something that works for us. Maybe we don't. Or do we use something that does 60 to 70% of what we need that's very outdated? Uh, right now, we've chose the latter. We, we've had to make do with what we have. Um, but the ultimate goal is to build out our own software so we can be more in control of that. And if you do that, I'm assuming you go raise kind of third, you bootstrapped everything to date. You kind of go raise some type of third party venture funding or something and really yeah. ramp that up. Exactly. Like who are your competitors? ShipBob, uh, ShipMonk. Those are both are billion dollar valuations. They've each been around since 2014. Um, Red Stag Fulfillment, um, Ship Daddy. There's there's a bunch. There's a lot of competitors. A lot of people doing this, um, but not a lot of people that uh, e-commerce brands are happy with. Um, it's it's just a hard business to do well. And uh, did they get their billion dollar valuations because they built tech or just because they have a ton of EBITDA or something? Um, I don't even know if they have any EBITDA. Um, I mean, yeah. any positive EBITDA, but they, they built out their own tech, which enabled them to grow and scale really fast. And they've raised a, just a ton of money. Um, uh, my two biggest competitors have raised nine figures in the last six months each. So what, if, if I'm, if I'm now interviewing them and I go, what are you going to do with that nine figures? Do you know what they're going to do with it? They're, they're building an international presence. Yeah. I know that. And more warehouses. So really what a lot of my competitors are trying to do is emulate Amazon, yeah. basically to open up more distribution centers for a cheap one and two day shipping. Does Amazon still win? <laughs> or is there just enough room for everybody to succeed? There's, I mean, can, what, do, what do you consider winning, right? Like they're a trillion dollar company. Um, there's so much room for everyone to succeed. Yeah. Um, I don't even think they have a majority of the e-commerce market share. Yeah. You still have Shopify. There's over like 1.4 million Shopify stores. You have Big Commerce. You have Magento. You have WooCommerce. There's a lot of other players out there. Amazon to me is is just different. It's it, <laughs> Amazon is a company that owns everything every end of the supply chain, whereas all those other options I just mentioned are, they don't, they let you yeah. own it. So I'm going to try and ask this the right way. I ordered a pair of shoes the other day and I, I order so much through Amazon now and I'm a prime member that it hasn't dawned on me anytime recently that 
Um, I have to pay more or less for like faster shipping. I just, it's always like one day shipping and it's mm-hmm. always free, but I was ordering a pair of shoes, these on its shoes and it, I get to the bottom of the thing and it's like, you know, if you want it on Tuesday, it's $25 extra. If you want it on Wednesday, it's $15 extra. If you don't want to pay shipping, you have to wait like a week. And now I'm sitting here like on your side thinking, okay, you already have the inventory at your warehouse. If I'm paying $25 extra, is anything really different happening or is that like pure margin now? Because you can get me the shoes in a day no matter what. Am I really paying anything extra? So they're just putting you to the top of the line. So they okay. probably use a 3PL, like I just mentioned, that takes two to three days to ship their orders. Mm-hmm. They're just, they're putting you to the top of the line. So it's, they're using the same carrier, the same truck and everything. Okay. I was imagining that they're putting them on some like fighter jet that's just getting it there quicker. <laughs> it, it's, it's really nothing else is changing other than like you're at the top of the line. Yeah. Has that, is that changed now in an Amazon world? Like 20 years ago when you paid more for shipping, was something different happening or have you always just been bumped to the front of the line? Yeah, you still can. Um, a lot of times it will tell you at uh, checkout, like this will be overnight and this will be ground. That is different, right? Yeah. It's literally be- the difference between going on a truck and a plane. Um, but a lot of times it's just a pure margin play. So you're an entrepreneur. You clearly have like, we'll call it product market fit. You've got something that's working. You have spent no money on marketing and keep getting sales. And oh, by before I even ask this, um, Sam Parr is a good friend of mine. Mm-hmm. Obviously, you're, you're on trends too. Uh, like, do you, do you, it sounds like you're pretty, are you active on trends or is oh, that yeah. like the only thing you've ever posted? Um, yeah, I'm, I'm fairly active on there. Okay, so let's just talk about that. You're the first guest I've had other than Sam that's an active like trends user why do you use it and like what value do you get out of it i mean i've gotten a dozen half a dozen customers from trends okay i mean six figures mrr in my business from trends purely like what did you do to get those customers um a lot of times people are so trends has an e-commerce group specifically Mm -hmm. and people just post like hey i need a good 3pl and i'll just respond i've never like solicited or actively hey i'm a 3pl come use me Mm -hmm. but i'll just respond and then they'll interview me, I'll interview them, and then they'll ask for a referral and I'll say, hey, this guy's in trends, just call him up, see if he's happy with me. And so that has been extremely beneficial to me. And in addition, like like I was telling you earlier, I'm a, I have an entrepreneur ADD, right? I love learning about new ideas. I can't stay focused. And so yeah. that email every week is like, oh, what's what's going on in the in the glamping space? What, yeah. Like just stuff that I shouldn't be reading, you know? And yeah. So it's just, it's entertainment to me as well. Okay. So do you ever get that type of value from any other network that you're a part of or trends is like the gold standard for that stuff right now? Yeah. For me, I think it is. That's badass. Yeah. Okay. Now I'm going to go back to the other question. You're the entrepreneur. Um, you've built and sold multiple companies. Like, what are you going to do with this one? We want to grow it as big as we can. Okay. Yeah. Does we- that mean taking on outside money? Yeah. Yeah. And growing it just means more locations and more customers. Exactly. And continue to work on the process and kind of that lean mentality of switching a guy's boxing by like a degree so that he might crank out two extra boxes a week. Yeah, absolutely. We would love to actually have a sales and marketing team, an account manager, um, and we want to build out our own tech and we want to open more warehouses. So we would love to have three warehouses, Pennsylvania, Dallas, Reno, to have our own software that we can fully control end to end and then to actually hire more people. So that's, that's the end goal for us is just to keep doing exactly what we're doing just on a bigger scale. Do you guys eventually take over the, um, at scale, when I hear businesses like this, I think of like, will you guys start becoming your own insurer and like selling the insurance? (laughs) It's funny you ask that. We've actually talked seriously about that Yeah, because we have all the data. We know exactly how many boxes are getting broken in transit or not arriving. And so if we were to insure each box, that could be a profit center for us yeah. because we would know that it that it would work or not. And so that is something that we've talked about doing. Have you ever heard of Gazova? They're local? No. Okay. They're like a... Uh, they're kind of like Uber for if you need to like move a sofa out of your house. Okay. You can just like go in an app, do it. And two guys in a truck show up immediately and get and get rid of it. But, hmm. but they now offer trip insurance and, and like, as soon as you can start selling your own insurance, just another uh, revenue lineup yeah. seemed, um, pretty interesting. Um, on cardboard boxes, was this a rumor, but did we almost run out of cardboard boxes kind of nationwide during COVID? I, we never did. Where do you get your cardboard boxes from? Just from a manufacturer. And you just get all different sizes and 
Um, again, does that come from the customer that's telling you like, you have to use this style of cardboard box? Sometimes it is. Sometimes we just have to learn it ourselves. Okay. Yeah. And then you're, and then you have like a label machine that automatically prints off the labels and you yep. just slap them on there and you go. Yep. Okay. What's like the worst. And I love these kind of small business stories. You've been in it a year. What's like the one, has there been a day or something that happened? That, and, and this morning you had all the copper ripped out of your building. So yeah. your freezers went down, but you did the entrepreneur thing, got a generator. What's been the worst like day that you're like the world's ending. I can't believe I'm in this business. There's been a lot of days like that. <laughs> um, I'm going to think of the most obvious one. So we had, <clears throat> we rented a commercial freezer from a company yeah. for our frozen customers. And this is when we we're at our uh, 1600 square foot warehouse. Mm -hmm. And the, this freezer company was just a nightmare to work with. They were not living up to their end of the deal. They weren't servicing the unit. And so we had to move out um, from our old unit to the unit that we're in now, but we had to leave the freezer behind. And so we had, oh, no, 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 that wasn't it. The freezer was a nightmare, but our landlord was a nightmare. We, it was an air conditioned unit and he never got the AC fix. And so we were hundred degrees. We were packing orders in there. And then we finally just had to get it fixed ourselves. And then the landlord sent another guy out and broke the AC again on accident. It was just a nightmare. Anyway, we had to get our freezer out of our old unit and we had already moved. And so I went to go get the freezer or I sent a guy with a flatbed truck to get the freezer. And this, you can't picture this, um, <laughs> this old warehouse I was at, but it was at the end of a dirt road. It was like the most janky, just, it was just like a big rednecks playground. Okay. It was like 20 acres in Parker. And it was at the very end of this dirt road. And they wanted me to pay my security deposit when we left. And I said, I'm not paying that because you didn't live up to your end of the deal. And so they held our freezer hostage. And so I like in the middle of the night hired a flatbed truck to come just take it. Right. Cause they were holding it hostage and I had to give it back to the company we were renting it from. And so he went to go get it and they took a cement truck and a dump truck and a Bobcat and parked it right up against the, the roll up door to literally prevent us from getting it. And then they took a pile of gravel and just for good measure and dumped it right in front of the door as well. And so we had these products that were melting and they cut off my power. And so we ended up just having to pay my landlord and <laughs> get the freezer out of there. But we won't have to say which landlord it was. It wasn't me. Yeah, I know no, that for damn sure. It was not. We you. have owned some stuff in Parker County, but it wasn't us. <laughs> All right. You got a fascinating business. The, the the tailwinds really are at your back. It's going to be exciting to watch this thing um, scale. We'll head into a few more kind of fun personal discussions, and I and I would be remiss not to ask you to tell us the story about partnering with John McAfee. Yes. So this is the security guy, right? Yeah. Okay. McAfee Security. Yeah. Yeah. So, all right. So I'm big into crypto. Right. I I'm a firm believer of Bitcoin. Okay. being the future. I have a lot of my holdings in that. And so 2017 was the last big bull market for crypto. And all of these altcoins were just going crazy. And one day I had just, I had this thought and I thought there has to be a way to predict which altcoins are going to just go crazy. And I thought, you know, it's all, there's no fundamentals here. It's all emotion. It's all hype. So I wonder if I could find a way to quantify how much hype a coin had versus the market size, the market cap of the coin. And so I partnered with my friend. He's a super nerdy, smart guy. And he created an algorithm with me that it took like everyone's, every altcoin's Twitter mentions, Twitter followers, Reddit mentions, Reddit followers, Facebook, just mentions online everything. And he assigned a score to it. And then we just took an API through coinmarketcap.com, which has all the data on all these coins. And we just divided it against the market cap. And so if it had high hype, but low market cap, then our algorithm said, buy. Like that's going to go like the hype has, the market cap has not caught up with the hype yet. But if it had low hype and high market cap, then it was sell short, right? Because there's just not enough hype supporting this. And so over the course of about a month, we built up this, it was just all in one Google sheet. And it was all these APIs pulling from CryptoCompare.com and CoinMarketCap and Reddit and Twitter and all these places. But at the end of the day, it gave us a ranking one through 100, best to worst, of which altcoins had the most upside. And it worked. 
and I started investing in it and it was like, it worked really well. And no one knew about this. I had no followers on Twitter. It was just like a project I was doing. So I thought, man, like not only does this work, but this could become a self-fulfilling prophecy, right? You tell people this is going to go up. Now they're actually buying it and then it actually is going up, right? So I thought if I, I need to launch this, like I need to monetize my hobby, right? Mm -hmm. Just like I said. And so how do I do this? So I, you know, I can grind for months and build a Twitter following and build a business and put a website, or I can just partner with an influencer. And so I just looked at all the crypto influencers out there. And at the time, John McAfee was the biggest. Yeah, I remember this. Yeah. I mean, now you have Pompliano and you've got the Winklevi and you've got some really smart, like reputable people that know a lot and that are well-respected at the time. Those guys were still around, but they weren't as well known. And it was, it was John McAfee and he was who he is. He's, he's crazy. And he's just, he's, he's a loose cannon and he is exactly what you hear about him. Right. He was like living on a yacht with like tigers on it and yes. stuff at the time that you were like yes. talking to him. Okay. Keep going. Yeah. And so everything you heard about him is true. Uh, I, the murder charge. I don't know about that. Yeah. Right? yeah I can't, yeah. I wasn't there <laughs> anyway. So I just thought, man, if I could get him to tweet about this, this could blow up. And the idea was to have a paid community like trends. And at the time there were a lot of these, there were like these traders that would have a paid community. that would be like half a Bitcoin a month just to be a part of this community. And at the time that was like $400 a month. And so I thought, man, if I could get all these paid members, I could just give them my picks. They could invest accordingly. And so I need to get a hold of John McAfee. And so he famously does not like getting a hold of, right? He's very secretive. And so I just started trying to guess his email address. And so I tried like John at McAfee.com, J McAfee at McAfee.com, JM, you know, trying all these. And I used this email software that tells me if my email has been opened or not. And they were getting bounced back. No one was opening them. And then I got, I sent one that didn't bounce back and it got opened. I was like, that's gotta be him. I think I guessed it. And so he, he didn't respond. So I emailed up again. I'm like, Hey, follow me up. And my pitch was like, listen, John, you're in a crypto. I'm in a crypto. I've created this algorithm. I want to present it to you. I want to partner with you on it. Um, are you interested? And he wouldn't respond. So I emailed him and he finally emailed me back and he's very skeptical and frankly rude. And he just said, <laughs> like, he said, Chris, like, I don't care if God himself presents himself to me and says that your algorithm works. Like, I don't buy it. I don't believe it. I don't want anything to do with it. And he didn't really understand my pitch. And I saved all these emails and um, I emailed him back. I'm like, just let me show it to you. Just give me some, I'll go to your house. Let me show it to you. And he, he came back and he was skeptical and we kept going back and forth. And then, so finally he said, all right, I live in Lexington, Kentucky, or Lexington, um, Tennessee. Um, I will give you my address the morning of, and it was like February 28th, 2018, I think, or 17. I don't remember. And uh, he says, meet me at 1.23 p.m. at my house and I'll give you the address the morning of. So I was like, okay. So I I flew to Huntsville, Alabama because I had friends there. That's where I used to live. And it was like two hours north. And so that morning I emailed him and I'm like, hey, I'm in Huntsville. I'm, I'm coming up. What's your address? And he never responded. So I was like, all right, I'm just going to start driving towards that city. And so I just started driving and I checked my email on the way. And he finally responded. He gave me his address. And so I was like, okay, this is on. And so I get to his neighborhood and it's like a fairly, it's like an upper middle class neighborhood. And I pull in and he lives in like, it's like a Southern neighborhood, Brook Homes, right? Kind of like you'd see around here. And he lives in like this Spanish style stucco, like a home straight out of California in the middle of this neighborhood. It just looked totally off. There was like a yellow Hummer next to like a beat up Nissan and just like, you could tell he was like the problem child of the HOA, right? And so I get there and it was like 1.20 p.m. So I waited three minutes in the car. And then at 1.23, I knocked and he opened the door himself with his wife, just totally confused. And he's like, he didn't know who I was. I was like, hey, John. He's like, who are you? I was like, I emailed you about that algorithm. And he's like, oh, he's like, Right. Yeah, sure. Yeah. You can predict crypto. Right. Yeah. I remember you. Sure. Okay. Listen, I've got this film crew from Australia here. It's like the Australian 60 minutes. They're filming a documentary on me right now. It's a crazy day. We're about to go to the liquor store. Uh, just come inside, sit at my dining room table, wait for me. I'll be right back. So I'm like, okay. So I walk in and there's like a camera crew. There's like a boom and like armed guards with like 
AR-15s, like I'm not exaggerating, guns everywhere. I go in his kitchen, I sit down in his breakfast nook and the whole, all the countertop tops are just liquor bottles everywhere. And I'm a Mormon guy, right? Like, what am I doing here? It's like smoke billowing out. And like, as soon as I get there, like everyone leaves and I'm just sitting there. What I thought at the time was alone in his house and not knowing when they'd be back. And it's just, the juxtaposition was crazy because this guy is like hyper security, just super secretive. He's got armed guards. And then all of a sudden a stranger walks in and I'm at a table and there are laptops and hard drives at the table with me, just sitting on the table. And I'm like, there could be a hundred million dollars worth of Bitcoin on that. And he's just letting me sit next to it. It was just weird. And so I, I like took videos and sent them to my friend. I'm like, I'm in John McAfee's house. If I go missing, like, yeah. <laughs> and so, so I just sat there and I just waited. And then I heard a guy around the corner cough. I was like, is someone here? <laughs> so I go around the corner and his uh, assistant slash bodyguard, Jimmy, uh, was there. And he was just like a former Navy SEAL, just like this huge meathead looking guy. And um, he he was on his MacBook. He's like, what's up, man? What? Oh, are you the algorithm? And he was actually pretty friendly. You the algorithm guy? Oh, cool. Sit down. Let's talk. So I just like gave him my pitch. And he's like, oh, man, this is going to work. This is huge. Man, I can't wait till Mr. McAfee gets back and I'm going to sell this to him so hard. Like, this is going to be huge. And I was like, okay, cool. You know? <laughs> so we just sat there and talked for a while. And then they all got back. And John... McAfee sits down. So now we're at like the dining table around the corner and he sits down and he's like, all right, I'm going to give you an hour. He's like, give me your pitch. And so I was like, all right. So I opened my MacBook and I was like, here's, and I just start going into it. And then the cameraman was like, Hey, do you mind if we film this? And he's like, do you care, Chris? I'm like, uh, no. So like, this is going to be in like the Australian 60 minutes. It was a whole hour long special about John McAfee. I was like, okay, I didn't expect that. So whatever. And so like all these people sit around me and the camera's on me. And he's like, all right, give me your pitch. So I give him the pitch and I, I tell him everything. And like within 30 seconds, he's like, this is brilliant. Like he doesn't 180 immediately. I was just like this idiot kid. And now he's like, Chris, this is, this is brilliant. Like this, Chris, you're brilliant. This is, we're going to make so much money. All right. What do you want me to do? I'll, anything. What do you want me to do? Like he just, the opportunist in him just like wow. fr- freaked out. And so I was like, well, I want you to tweet about this and I want to start a free community and give people some of the the picks and then launch a paid community off the free community that's like hundreds of dollars a month where I give them all the picks, everything. And I show them how it works. And he's like, let's do it. All right. So we agreed. I think I agreed to give him like 25% of the profit or something. And so we, uh, we kind of have a handshake agreement and I, I'm there like the whole day, like he ends up getting Mexican food and then like they filmed the special in the living room and it was just the wildest day of my life, like so out of place. And, um, I leave and I, I call my wife and like, babe, you won't believe what just happened to me. And then, uh, I get home and I launched this paid community and, um, are you familiar with discord? Yeah. So it was all in discord and, um, <laughs> I didn't know what I was doing right with this community so i launched a discord group and it was called no bs crypto and um just because you know these picks actually worked it wasn't just like a pump and dump it was based on actual data and so i wanted to be like different like this is no bs like this actually is real and so i launched this this community and i hadn't changed the settings to where um basically the settings the discord settings by default were anyone that joined the group could make themselves an admin of the group oh yeah okay and so i made a link and i got a website ready and john mcafee was texting me and he's like all right let me know when it's ready i'm going to tweet out and he had nine hundred thousand followers and so he tweeted and he said and he i basically told him exactly what to tweet and he he was going to tweet twice a week about me whatever i wanted him to to drive traffic to this group and um, so it said, like, no BS crypto is this algorithmic picks that will predict the future price of an altcoin, like join this discord group for free access. So he tweeted it out and like within seconds, like I don't even know how people click that fast within seconds, like a thousand members, five thousand members, ten thousand members. And like the feed started blowing up. It's just like a group chat. Right. And I like my eyes get big and I was like, wow, we're doing it. This is amazing. And then all of a sudden, like hackers and then like porn flashing across the screen and it's like what what is happening like immediately from 100 to zero and then it was like everything just started spamming out and then all this spam and then people like the the name their username turned blue which means they're an admin like all these people were becoming admin and booting other people and it just within seconds it became like overrun by 
quote unquote hackers. And it was really just people that knew Discord well enough to make themselves an admin. And I lost full control over it, like immediately. And I was like, what, uh, what have I just done? Like, there's no reversing this. And so I call him, I'm like, John, uh, I'm so sorry. Um, uh, hackers <laughs> took over the channel. Uh, I need you to tweet it again. I need you to delete that tweet. And I need to send you a new link. And he's like, I never delete tweets. It's against everything I am. I never delete tweets. I was like, John, like, we have, I have to close this channel down. So people are going to be clicking to a dead link. And he was pissed. I was like, I- I'm sorry, but I, we have to do this. He's like, all right. So he deleted it and I gave him a new link where I set all the settings up and he's like, hackers took over the channel. Try this link. And then people came back in, but like, it was like a third of how many people came in before. Yeah. And, uh, but then that launched the community and we had this big thriving community and he tweeted about it twice a week and thousands of more people would join. And so my Twitter handle used to be at no BS crypto. And so we launched this big product and we launched our own token. We got listed on exchanges and I wrote like this 18 page white paper and it was like this community based token that would vet other projects. And like, we had like a team in Nigeria that were like, it was like for a year, it was like, it became like this big thing with this token It's a market cap of, I don't know, 30 million or something. And we got listed on these exchanges and then we did a free airdrop. I got like 55,000 retweets on this airdrop. (laughs) And uh, I went from like zero to 80,000 Twitter followers. I don't know how many of them were bots. And then like the uh, the market just it started crashing, right? Like it, Bitcoin went and then everything went with it. And all these altcoins went down 85, 90, 95%. And the community just started drying up. And I just shut it down. I gave it over to the community. Like I gave the community half a Bitcoin for like operating costs. And then I just gave them all the passwords and the website. And I said, guys, like, run with this like i'm done here dude what? and they just took it yeah did you actually make any money off of it while you had it i made some money not off the ton. community or the coins that you were pumping um off the community and you weren't really pumping the coins you were just telling people look we have this algorithm that's taking all this data and we're just showing you where the hype is here's the market cap the odds are very good that this is exactly. about to run yeah how does what happened in 2017 how do you feel what's going on right now um, similar feeling or are we different this time? It's similar, but different. There was no institutional capital back then, oh. right? There was no <clears throat> Tesla buying Bitcoin or PayPal or Visa. So it is different, but I still think it runs in four year cycles. I still think we'll have a 50 plus percent drawdown at some point, but I don't think we're going to see 50 plus percent drawdown until Bitcoin's at six figures. I think we'll get to six figures this year. Why is it in four year cycles? They're having cycles. Ah. So the, the, the mining reward gets cut in half every four years. And so there are some charts out there that show predictably, like it goes up 10 X and then it drops 80%. It grows up 10, 20 X and it drops 80%. It's been very, uh, cyclical. Um, but I do think there's a lot more institutional capital booing it up. I don't think we'll see another 80% drop. So when, when are we supposed to expect the next drop? Um, like, wouldn't that be pretty soon? The charts show it would be near the end of this year. Yeah. So when you think about that, do you just, are you a a hodler? I'm a hodler. So you don't sell when it goes down? I'm never selling ever. Okay. So I don't want to like, when did you get introduced to crypto and when were the lights going off that, holy shit, this is the next thing. Yeah. So 2016, I first bought Bitcoin at 760 and I felt like an idiot. Because uh, I can see the chart. It used to be five bucks. It used to be five cents. So, you know, you're buying at the peak. Um, but man, I wish I bought a lot more at 760 bucks. Did somebody... So, no, I just, I was Googling it. I just, I was speculating on it, right? Yeah. And I actually got scammed out of my first $5,000 worth of Bitcoin. I I did, I invested it in this mining uh, pyramid scheme. It was a total scam. Like I totally, I deserved every second of it. Right. I got scammed and that Bitcoin would be worth like 300 grand a day, but I'm actually grateful that happened because like once that happened, I actually started learning about the fundamentals of it and it wasn't just a speculative play. And I bought a lot more and I was like, wow, this is like, I need to hold this forever. And so like, I plan on never, ever selling my Bitcoin, like I'll loan against it you know, borrow against it, but I plan on passing it down to my kids when I die. And I, I fully believe it'll be worth seven figures in five years per coin per, per Bitcoin. Yeah. And six figures this year. So that would just be a little 10,000 X return on your money. It'd be nice. (laughs) It'd be nice. Um, 
is there anything else you like ethereum or i love ethereum so i'm about 70 percent bitcoin okay 20 percent ethereum and then 10 percent like moonshot altcoin bets i had a buddy that turned like 250k into four million dollars in like three days a few weeks ago on the safe moon coin yeah have you heard about I this have some coin? safe moon yeah but can you can you sell it at any point you can swap it you can yeah that's where i yeah the, the swapping and you gotta do this and that that's where i'm still learning and you know i'm i'm probably the idiot in the room but the more i hear like well you got to swap it for this and then swap it for that it just sounds scammier the more yeah. like swaps that are involved in it right um can you debunk that why, why do swaps exist so the swap isn't the scam part of it the coin itself could be for all we know um, safe moon itself. And I, I bought like a little bit just because just to be part of it. Right. But the swaps happen because it's not liquid enough yet. It's such a new coin that exchanges have not accepted it yet. So you have to swap it for another token because there are services like Shapeshift that will, you can, you can get liquid with a token by swapping with another token, but there are no exchanges where you can actually sell it for USD or Bitcoin yet because it is so new. But as more time happens, if they ever get listed on like a Binance or a Coinbase, then you can get liquid. You won't have to swap it to, to get liquid because right now you have to swap it for like Ethereum and then sell Ethereum yep. to liquidate. But you don't sell. Um, I'm not selling my Bitcoin ever. Would you sell Ethereum? No, not that either. Whatever happened to John? So he's in prison. What do you go to prison so for? Just like a few months ago, he got busted on tax fraud. And he basically made tens of millions of dollars um, pumping ICO projects. Yeah. And he would take like, he would tweet about it and get like 25% of the entire supply of the ICO, 25% of the company, and then just dump it and then never report any of it to the government. And so he just never paid taxes on millions and millions of dollars of crypto gains. Was he always a lunatic or did he like do too many drugs? Cause he built one of the best security softwares of all time. Or yeah. At least it was in its generation. Right. Was he always that way? Or do you even know? I don't know. They're making a movie about him. Are you going to be in the movie? <laughs> no. <laughs> no, I think like, uh, I think I heard Zac Efron was playing him or someone. It's going to be like a major motion picture on his life. That is one of the coolest stories yeah. I've heard. I like it. Um, okay. So you've never wanted to do anything entrepreneurial within crypto or maybe like, would you say to anybody listening, it's still really, really, really early in the crypto yeah. game? I, th I think we're very early. I think it's like Amazon in the late nineties. You know, it's still been around for a while. The huge drawdowns over the last two decades, but I think e-commerce is still early. Yeah. I mean, you only know how early you are once it's all the way behind you, right? right? I think anyone that bought Bitcoin under a million or under $100,000 will be considered early in the long run. All right. Thanks for sharing that. No I was, I'll tell you one more uh, funny story about crypto and maybe where we are in the market. I have no idea. But the other night I was at my favorite restaurant and the bartender who works one night a week uh, at the restaurant, she's a librarian the rest of the time. Kind of interesting librarian and a bartender. It's like two opposite ends of the world. I'm like, hey, what's going on? And she's like, nothing. Uh, I just started learning how to tr tr uh, trade crypto this week. And I was like, oh, God, God, we are so like, far past the top of the market. We're at the top. We are so far. So. And then I'm looking to my right, and there's this probably 65-year-old kind of boomer couple and I was like, do y'all know anything about crypto? Just kind of hoping they're like, no, never heard of it. And this guy's like, yeah, that's all we do. She trades during the day and I trade at night. And when we flip and I was and they're like, have you ever heard of this thing? And I'm, I think it's called CryptoProTrader.com. Okay. And he's like. I pay this lady in, it was some uh, Asian country, $99 a month to trade crypto on my behalf. Oh my gosh. And I was like, what? <laughs> and he's like, the crazy part is they can't even get into my wallet and they've already made me 111% my first week. Of course they have. And so the story gets better. So I'm like, well, how much did you give her? Now I'm just kind of playing, like in the back of my mind, I'm like, I got to at yeah. least hear this one out. And he probably thinks you're interested. Oh, I yeah. am like, 
I'm like, this is awesome. How do I get in on this? And he's like, well, I only gave her a thousand dollars for the first, or she only had access to a thousand dollars the first week, but she turned it into 2000. And then of course I asked, asked like, okay, but could you take it out immediately? He's like, well, you can only sell like a hundred a day. I'm like, okay. Well, you got to let the interest keep compounding. This is getting good. So then he goes, and he goes, so once I proved it on a thousand, I just put a hundred thousand in and I'm like, oh oh, oh, no, here we go. So then this is when I just, I just was laughing my ass off. So once he tells me the hundred thousand and in the bottom of my stomach, I'm sick. I'm like, yeah, I hope this isn't a scam. So then I go, um, well, I got to get in on this. Yeah. And he goes, well, I actually have something for you. And he goes, what's your cell phone number? And he texts it to me and it's a link. And he's like, be sure if you sign up, you sign up on this link. And I was like, why does that matter? And he's like, oh, well, I know how you pay her 99 bucks a month. I only get $15 a month of your 99 if you sign up. So I was like, so wait, this is like a pyramid scheme. And he's like, no, it's not a pyramid scheme, but the more people that sign up on me, the more they get money. So I was like, so you're paying some lady in Asia $99 a month to make you 111% returns a week, just gave her a hundred grand. And you want me to sign up so that you can make 15 bucks a month off of me. And like, right at that time, he was like signing out and he was on his way and he walked out and I was like, one, we're at the top of the market Two, I feel really sorry for that person. And, um, Anyway, I'm a big crypto believer too. I'm I I don't I don't sit here and say I be, like fully understand it yeah. all yet. But I, follow the money and follow the talent, and it's all headed into crypto. Like yeah. there's something there. Um, yeah, I mean, six percent of Americans own crypto. Yeah, six six. It's still very early. Yeah. Okay, what's one thing you believe in that most people in the world don't believe in? Hmm. Is this like a question you ask everyone? Yeah. Should I prepare for this? I, I actually should be nice and like give people a little bit of opportunity because everybody usually just kind of pauses for a second. Yeah. Um, I'll be asking it a different way so it's not so demanding. Just what's something that you think about a lot that like m- most people aren't picking up on? Like maybe okay. it's crypto or I don't know. Or like what about like a life philosophy? Anything. All right. I think that everyone is insecure. Everyone out there is insecure. They have deep insecurities. And if they're aware of those insecurities, it can drive them to be like Steve Jobs or Elon Musk, or it can drive them to just be a nobody. Like I think our insecurities can drive us to be our best or our worst selves. The difference is just being self-aware of those. Do you think that we're like the product of the environment we live in today with social media and everything, like people are more insecure than they've ever been, or we're just getting exposed more than we've ever been exposed? That's a good question. I, I, I lean the latter. We're that, just more aware of it. Yeah. That's that Gary V kind of preaches that he's like, social media didn't make people crazy. It just like exposed yeah. people for what they really were. Even, yeah. you know, they've always been, um, I, I usually ask the question on the childhood. Ex- I, I ask, is there a childhood experience that you remember that shaped who you are today? your trip around the world or to Hungary was later in life, but it was, was, was there something kind of early on that happened that made you an entrepreneur or, you know, made you who you are today that you draw back on? Um, honestly, I think just growing up poor. Yep. Like I, I started my first business, like age eight, I, I found and washed and sold used golf balls. I lived across the street from a golf course and just like having, like, if I wanted a yearbook, I had to pay for it. If I wanted to go on a field trip, I had to pay for it, you know, as like a 12 year old, you know, and to me at the time that was normal. Yeah. And now as a father, it's like, what? Like I was doing my laundry at age 10. Like yeah. I was. And so that's, we were talking at lunch. Like yeah. I want my kids to have a good life, but to also be able to know like what it's like to have to work for things. And so I'm super grateful. I grew up having to actually work for those things because now it's like, it's a part of who I am. Yep. No, we do. I thought it was a great conversation. I've talked about this with others. Like your success has an opportunity. It's like the success you want, but it's hard to deliver that opportunity to your kids, which we said is a superpower is like being broke or poor or knowing what it's like to, to, to have to earn for something is a superpower. Yeah. Um, and I feel sorry for people that never have that kind of grit yeah. built into them. Yeah, I agree. I think like you were talking about the world we live in with social media. Like we live in a world that's so comfortable. Like 
98% of Americans are so comfortable. Like if you want to, if you want to go get a salad, you have to drive by eight fast food restaurants to get there. Like there's so much friction to be uncomfortable. Yep. Right. And so like one thing that a huge belief system of mine is to do like uncomfortable, hard things. Yeah. Um, and like, I think that not enough people, like you have to go out of your way to do hard things. You yeah. have to seek after it and find it. And I think that just builds you into so much greater of a human being than, than you would become otherwise. Is there something like, as you think about your kids today, like what could you put in front of them that would make them uncomfortable given that you've made some money, you, you, you know what success looks like. Um, you're a byproduct of that. Like, how do you think about that in front of your kids? Like how, how would you make them uncomfortable? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, well, we have a small farm that we live on. Okay. And so we, we make them do chores. They have to do inside chores before they get any screen time. Uh, their screen time is limited. Um, if they screw up at school, like if they forget something, like we let them fail, we let them experience small failures. And, you know, if they didn't do their homework, like we don't bail them out. We, we force them to, to face that themselves, even yep. as seven or an eight year old. Um, and they have to know what that feels like that, what that anxiety, what that fear feels like. And, um, I think that most parents are too quick to, to bail out their kids, to jump in, yep. to be a helicopter parent. So we, we try to not do that. It's hard. It it's, is. Especially when you're willing and able and you have the opportunity to bail them out. It's really hard. Yeah. Somebody told me the other day, like the more, like your kids will cry and they'll be upset and they're not happy about the situation. He's like, just remember, like the more upset you see them in situations like that, the more they're going to love you down the road mm -hmm. when they realize full circle why you made them do all that. But it's hard to like, that's 20 years down the road that you're probably going to finally get that call oh, from your son going, thanks for letting me fail. I hope I get that call one day. Yeah. I think about that a lot. Yeah. My, uh, I have one daughter and she's terrible at cleaning her room. She has her own room and then our boys share a room. And uh, so she would not clean her room at all. And so I'm like, Avery, clean your room, ah, clean your room. Ah. And so I gave her room to her brother and I made her go sleep with her brothers. And I was like, he keeps his room clean. So he gets your room now. And that was kind of a wake up call to her. And she ended up having an opportunity to, to work it back. But, um, how much screen time do you give him? Uh, like a half hour during the week. Okay. And then on like total or every day, every day. Okay. And then on sa Saturday mornings, uh, my wife and I like to have like a long workout. Yeah. And so they get like two hours on Saturday morning and then Sunday we don't have any, we just spend time as a family. Yeah. Yeah. My, my oldest is only four and we, we caught ourselves like she would do good things and therefore she could earn the iPad, but that glorifies the iPad. Yeah, totally. But my little four-year-old, I'm telling you, one, she she could take my wife's phone out of her purse. She knows the passcode. She could call me and FaceTime me like no problem. Uh, we kind of limited to YouTube kids or a few educational things. But man, you give her that iPhone or that iPad and I can sit there and talk to her in the room and sh she is not hearing me. She mm -hmm. they, they get so zoned in. I know. And we didn't have that as kids. Yeah. We were zoned in on like Connect Four, or like, yeah. you know, Battleship or something. Um I'm just really interested to see how this generation kind of comes out of it all and I what know. it's doing to them. I agree. They are not going to know what a dollar bill is. They'll, they'll all like Bitcoin. Hopefully. Which yeah. will be good. My kids all, they each have their own $25 portfolio. Oh, really? Yeah. They're competing against each other. Really? Yeah. We'd started like two weeks ago. So what'd you do? You put 25 bucks in each of their accounts? Uh -huh. Yeah. Just in my Robinhood account. Yeah. And um, I was like, all right, this is Bitcoin. Here's what it does. This is Ethereum. And then I was like, this is Dogecoin. And it's kind of like a joke. But at the same time, like, it doesn't really matter. It's a joke because people put value in it. Yeah. Right. And so my uh, my youngest, my five-year-old is actually winning because he bought mostly Dogecoin. <laughs> really? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but it's, they're just learning what it is, you know? That's awesome, man. Yeah. Dude, this has been actually one of my favorite episodes I've ever done. And we talked a lot about things that were had nothing to do with business. And we talked about a fascinating business that you're building. Thank, well, thank you very you. much for uh, coming on today. Absolutely. I appreciate you having me. Yeah, I'm glad we're friends now. Yeah, absolutely. Cool, man.